Hello, and thank you for joining us tonight for our free webinar, Treating Autoimmune Diseases with Chinese Herbs, featuring John Chen. My name is Jeff Bloom, Education Marketing Coordinator here at Lhasa OMS. For over 40 years, Lhasa OMS has been striving to promote the growth of the acupuncture industry by providing quality products, great prices, and the best customer service, as well as supporting the many schools and continuing education efforts available. With our free webinar series, we intend to provide free education opportunities taught by some of our industry's most renowned practitioners and educators. I would like to take a moment to acclimate you to the webinar room. We recommend viewing the webinar in Chrome, Firefox, or Safari as you can experience slowness in other browsers. To the right of the video screen, you will see three tabs, chat, questions, and polls. To chat with attendees or to communicate any technical difficulties, please use the chat tab. For questions, please use the questions tab to assure that our guest speaker answers them at the end of the lecture. Please note that each webinar is recorded and immediately following the conclusion of the webinar, you will receive an email with a link to view the video on demand. We will also share the recording with the slides and other complimentary material in the following week or two on our blog. You may always visit our blog and use the free webinar tag to find all of our previously recorded events. From sports puncture to CBD to practice management, you'll find something interesting for every practitioner on the LASA OMS blog. Now for our featured speaker. We are proud to introduce Dr. John Chen, medical consultant for Evergreen Herbs. He is recognized as an authority in both Western pharmacology and Chinese herbal medicine. He's taught at schools such as USC, UCSF, PCOM, Emperor's College, OCOM, and many more. Dr. Chen has published numerous articles and several books. His goal is to make both Western and Oriental medical communities aware of alternatives to drugs and the importance of identifying herb-drug interactions. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chen. Hello, everyone. Um, wanted to start with a little audio and video check, make sure everybody can hear me before I get into the meat of the material. So if somebody can type in the chat room that you can see me and hear me, that'll be great. All right, looks good. All right, let's go ahead and get started, okay? Uh, one of the things that I've been seeing in the last few years is um, patients are starting to come with different patterns of disorders. And then similarly, a lot of practitioners um, call with different sets of questions. And the trend has been that more and more questions seems to be related to autoimmune disease, or auto autoimmune disorders. And what happened is, uh, if you are, if you have not done research into this area, it's important to remember that autoimmune disease or disorder is not describing one single disease, but rather it's a uh, umbrella that includes or encompasses many, many different specific disease and disorders, uh, probably not less than a hundred. So here are uh, some of the list of those disorders, you know, basically from A to Z. So this is one of the first slide, this is a second slide, and this is a third slide and so on. And uh, my guess is there is probably one practitioner who is well versed in, any, in, in all of these diseases because there are just too many. And a lot of these terms are ones that we simply don't hear about regularly, much less we don't even you know, study about them in, at school. So a lot of time what happens is if a patient comes in, and tell you that I have a SUSAC syndrome, and do you have herbs to treat that? Or can Chinese medicine help me with that? And usually what happens is for most of the TCM practitioners, they freeze and they don't know what to do. You know, So they look like deer in front of headlights, and their first reaction is, oh my God, I've never heard of, heard of this condition before. Or, oh my God, I have never studied this in school before. I don't know what to do, all right? But um, I think what we all need to do as practitioner is just step, step back for a second, okay? Don't be trapped by the Western disease name and you know, knowing, thinking that there is exactly one formula for this disease condition, but rather step back and utilize what TCM has to offer. And that is look at entire person, you know, evaluate the signs and the symptom, look at the tongue, feel the pulse, okay? And then just determine a TCM diagnosis and go from there. So if you can step back, Okay, uh, fall back on your training and then utilize what you learn in school. And then generally speaking, you won't be anywhere as confusing or intimidating as this. 
All right. So what we'll do is we have one hour today, and we'll you know use this opportunity to talk about the overview or introduction into autoimmune disease. All right. So uh, the five main things that I want to briefly cover include the etiology, the immune system, the autoimmune disease side itself, and then how Western medicine treat these conditions, and other and also how does TCM treat these conditions. And this is a very ambitious goal, uh, trying to cover autoimmune disease in one hour. So uh, keep in mind that um, this is an introductory course. Um, I tried, this is actually a course, a class that I taught for eight hours, uh, eight hour CEU back a few years ago. And uh, when Lhasa asked me to do a class uh, you know, for one hour, I was preparing the handout or uh, the slides and I tried uh, as much as I can to make this a one hour class but I could not cut any more than 150 slides because if I do any more, I feel I'm not you justice. I'm missing you know, information for you. So don't think of this as that I did not cover all the slides, but rather you are getting about two extra hours for no charge. All right, so look on the bright side. All right, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. And we'll keep all, if you have any questions, uh, please write them down and I'll try to get to them at the end of the class. All right. One of the first thing and one of the most important thing to keep in mind is to see the overall trend. And the trend of different autoimmune disease is they are going quite high. All right, so this is a slide of just a few examples, including type 1 diabetes, asthma, multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, and so on. But overall, um, there are many other autoimmune disease, and they are becoming more and more prevalent. All right, so if you have an active TCM practice, chances are you definitely have seen this trend and uh, maybe struggle a bit to do a proper TCM diagnosis and treatment. So once again, hopefully this class will help you. One of the first things that to determine is how does the patient get here? Because when they come into our clinic, they have usually very confusing and complicated signs and symptoms, right? So how did they get to this point? All right, so if we know the cause, then hopefully we can backtrack and start by treating the signs and symptoms, treat the cause, treat the other etiology, and eventually starting from treating the symptom all the way to treating the cause. So some of the more common cause or factors that contribute to autoimmune include microorganisms, and that includes bacteria, virus, fungus, and parasites includes all the environmental chemicals, toxin, and allergens, okay? Also foods that trigger allergen autoimmunity. And then last, of course, is many other unknown and unclear factors. And the reason there are many is because uh, we are just looking at the tip of the iceberg as far as autoimmune disease is concerned. So uh, it may seem like we know a lot, but in reality, there's a lot more under the water that we don't know, okay? so. This is the beginning of the science uh, and art of uh, learning about autoimmune disease. And that actually applies to both Western medicine and TCM, all right? So what happened is all these things that we mentioned in the previous slide as far as causes go, whether it's microorganism, pollution, toxins, elements, and so on, they start from outside of the body, and then over time, they may invade the body, all right? And generally speaking, our immune system and our immune response will take care of it, all right? So most of the time, they don't even come inside. Um, they are just automatically rejected and um, defeated. But there are times when they do go inside of the body, and in both cases, um, a healthy person with a healthy immune system should be able to fight it off, okay? But when it's not able to, then gradually, that's when the signs and symptoms develop, and that's when the disease starts. All right, so let's look at some of the some of these causes in a little bit more detail. Right. This here is a simple table listing some of the microbes, uh, both bacteria and virus, that are commonly associated with autoimmune disease. All right, so what happened in these cases is when the patient get these bacteria or viral infection, whether it's herpes or Coxsackie virus or you know whatever the cause may be, um, the infection may not be properly treated. And then what happened is some of the bacteria, some of the virus, some of the viral particles or the viral lipopolysaccharides, 
they become accumulated in the body. They, they are hidden somewhere in the body. So even though the patient may no longer show active infections, um, the seeds are buried deep in the body. And at a later point, they may sprout or the immune system may try to attack these bacteria or virus or the tissues and then trigger the immunity um, disease. All right. So you may think, well, if that's the case, then everybody should get vaccination because if you get vaccination, then you can eliminate or uh, try not to get a lot of these uh, infections. But then what happened is uh, for a lot of the vaccination, it is utilizing the weakened or dead virus. So you're still introducing these virus to the patient's body. So if you can, as you can see here, a lot of the measles, mumps, rubella vaccines are linked to rheumatoid arthritis. In influenza vaccine could be, lead, could be linked to type 1 diabetes. Also, a lot of the older uh, vaccines uh, may still have heavy metals, such as mercury. So once again, uh, even though vaccine does help to fight against some infection uh, by introducing these virus or bacteria or metal to the body, you are introducing other variables that potentially could also be the trigger for autoimmune at a later time. Okay, so that's the microorganism part. Okay, besides that, there are a lot of things that are in our environment today uh, that are not natural. Okay, so there's a lot of chemicals, there's a lot of allergens, there are a lot of toxins, there are a lot of man-made things um, that from an evolution perspective, um, our body has never encountered these toxins. So what happened is these are foreign materials that by and large our immune system doesn't know how to deal with it. And then what happened is as these chemicals and toxins compounds spread all over the environment, we breathe it in through the air, air pollution, we drink it in through the water pollution, and also we eat it through the food pollution. So whether it's from the air, from the water, from the food, from the product that we use and so on, we get a lot of these toxins and chemicals into our body. And generally what happens is they come in at a very small, minuscule amount on a daily basis. All right, so in most cases, you know, it doesn't trigger an acute problem. But over time, okay, uh, especially if you work in a certain place and you get exposed to this um, on a regular basis, then what happens is these toxins then start to accumulate in your organs, in your tissues, and eventually when they get to a certain amount, then your immune system will start to become hyperactive, and that's when the disease begins. A lot of times, this may show up as allergy. This may show up as skin problems, nasal problems, asthma, and eventually they may show up as autoimmune. So basically, they are all indications of the immune system becoming hyperactive, all right? So now, uh, to put this in perspective, uh, this is a study done by CDC back in 2004. And what they have found is American Cross went across the U.S. to collect the fetal cord blood from 10 different newborn babies. And they found 287 industrial chemicals in the fetal babies, fetal blood. And these chemicals include pesticides, phthalate, dioxin, flame retardant, and many different byproducts of Teflon and others, right? So what happened is um, the pregnant mothers are exposed to these compounds and they pass them to the baby. So the babies a lot of time have a lot of issues right when they are born, okay? It's quite unfortunate, but this is becoming a bigger and bigger problem, okay? I have two kids, uh, one is 17, one is 15, and I remember going to a lot of their event. And what happened is, a lot of the kids, you know, have asthma, you know, have skin problems and allergies, you know, right at a very young age. Okay, so um, these are, you know, once again, the toxins and chemical they start to accumulate not as adults, but you know, uh, right before they were born. Okay, and no wonder there's such big problem with all the allergy and autoimmune problems. All right, so those are the chemicals, and once again, they can come from just about anywhere, from air, from water, from food, and so on. So as far as it goes, um, they can come from car exhaust, right? They can come from jet fuel, you know, from flying, from mining plants, from coal burning plants, from brush fire, forest fire, and also earthquake. Earthquake, in fact, release a lot of these heavy metal into the air, all right? So depending on where you live, okay, 
you may have many of these different factors uh, in your environment, all right? And specifically with air pollution, we need to worry about ozone, carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide. There could be a lot of toxic heavy metals in the air. There could be solvents or petrochemicals and so on. You know, so these are all potential um, toxins that exist uh, in the air pollution, all right? So if you can live in a place where there's less pollution, then, you know, more power to you. If not, then obviously try to uh, stay out of the environment on bad days with a lot of uh, pollution in the air. Uh, if you can, then obviously buy air purifiers for home, for work, and so on. Uh, at least try to clean it up a little bit more. All right. Uh, what also happened is a lot of us blame um, the other people for these problems. We blame the factories, we blame the uh, coast melting plants and so on. But what happened is we all need to take some responsibility because according to EPA, that's the Environmental Protection Agency. Chemical cleaners used in every day in the households make indoor air five times more polluted than the outdoor air. All right, so all these chemicals we use to clean the house actually probably may air even worse. Okay, so you may think you're cleaning the house, but then what happened is all the chemicals are inside your home where you live, where you sleep, and you breathe them right in. All right, so uh, if you're cleaning the house, by all means, if at all possible, just use white vinegar and baking soda. In most cases, that's more than enough. All right, so try not to contribute any more to chemical, uh, pol I mean, air pollution by using chemical cleans cleaners at home. All right. Uh, water too, something that we have to be very careful uh, because um, um, water does carry a lot of different pollutions. All right, so this is from Environmental Working Group. Uh, most of city water uh, have a lot of contaminants, including agricultural pesticides, urban lawn chemicals, different type of heavy metals and petrochemicals, and also various washing and byproducts. All right, so in most cases, it's a good idea not to drink the tap water. Okay, so if you can have some kind of water filter at home, so if you're cooking, if you are drinking, uh, it's better to come from those filter sources. So these chemicals don't go straight from the tap uh, into the body. All right, as far as food-wise, uh, we also have to watch out for a lot of different pos possible contaminants. Um, food, because they are grown from the soil, and as they grow, they take a lot of nutrients from earth, but they also pull out a lot of heavy metals. Uh, generally speaking, the four main ones to watch out for are lead, mercury, arsenic, and cadmium. Right? So you need to watch out for this, both in the food and also in the dietary supplements. Okay, Because once again, most of the di dietary supplements come from plants, and plants pull these things out of the soil, just like you know, uh, vegetables and fruits do. All right. Then of course, watch out for herbicide and pesticide. Okay. The three main categories of side and pesticides are organochlorine, organophosphorus, and also pyrethroids. Um, these three categories include hundreds of the most commonly used herbicide and pesticides. So if the test clears the product of these three, generally speaking, you'll be fine, all right? And then mycotoxins are something to watch out for as well. Uh, these are the four byproducts that are sometimes present in food if the food is ha harvested, and somehow it's wet or moist or stored in a humid environment. And then what happens is as fungus and mold start to grow, they will produce these toxic byproducts. All right. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So you know we are what to look, watch out for. All right. As far as heavy metal goes, um, I'm not going to go into the toxicity of the heavy metal. Uh, you can find them at a lot of uh, websites or text, okay, but rather, these are the general safety limits uh, based on concentration as established by various government agencies around the world. So WHO, World Health Organization, USP is US Pharmacopeia, EUP is European Union Pharmacopeia, Swiss is Swiss Medic from Switzerland, and TGA is Therapeutic Goods of Australia. Okay, so um, you may not, I mean, they are all a little bit different, but the point I want to get across here is if the product is tested and follow any of these government um, um, recommendations as far as safety minutes, limits, then you should be fine.
You know, that means um, the manufacturer, the distributors have done their homework to do the safety test for heavy metal. The variation is going to be a little bit from government to government, but I wouldn't stress that much uh, on it. Okay, so uh, that's, the, that's, that's my two cents as far as heavy metal limits. All right. So these are some examples of what the certificate of analysis looks like, basically the lab reports. So as you can see in the middle of this slide, that this particular product is called Zendongteng, which is a Lanisura vine, in which the heavy metals, the significant heavy metals are all tested, including arsenic, cadmium, lead, and mercury. All right. So this gives you and also your clients the assurance that you're not going to get into heavy metal problems by taking herbs or this particular herb. All right. Um, like I mentioned, you know, they are all kinds of herbicides and pesticides, but structurally speaking, many of them are very similar to each other. All right. So once again, when you do the testing, uh, the umbrella test to run is organochlorine, organophosphorus, and pyrethroids. Uh, because once the test clears these three, you are in fact checking for hundreds of different herbicides and pesticides. All right. And if not, then what happened is the common side effect are the toxicity side effect listed here, including dyspnea, respiratory depression, pulmonary edema, and so on and so forth. All right. So once again, uh, you want to make sure the food, the fruit, vegetable, fruits, the herbs you eat do not contain these herbicide and pesticides. All right. So once again, this is the same example with in Dongtang, Nalisura vine. And if you go a little go a bit farther down, you'll see that all three of the herbicide and pesticides are tested, and the result is ND, which means non-detected. Okay, so that's exactly what you're looking for. All right, and then once again, on a side note, okay, um, don't just blame the farmers or that grow the fruits and vegetables, because what happened is, once again, according to EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, Greater quantities of pesticides and insecticides, such as weak atrazine, is applied to suburban area than agricultural land. Okay, so once again, we all have to be partially responsible, right? So, you know, once in a while, if you know there's too many ants in your backyard or a lot of spider and so on, and you call your gardener to spray some herbicide and pesticide, well, guess what? We are all contributing, contributing in a small way to the air and the water and the soil pollution. Okay, uh, the next one are the mycotoxins. Uh, two of the mycotoxins are aflatoxin and also okra toxin. And like I mentioned, these are the byproduct from the, from the fungus and mold, okay, that are produced if the produce is harvested and stored while it's moist or wet or in humid environments. And then once that happens, uh, mold grows, they produce toxic byproduct. And then when that happens, you really have to throw away all these produce because they're gonna cause more harm than good, all right? So aflatoxin is something that's commonly found in food such as corn, peanuts, cotton seed, grain, tree nuts, milk, cheese, figs, spices, and so on. All right, so all these food generally speaking, need to be tested to ensure they are safe, okay? As far as Chinese herbs goes, you'll find, once again, a lot of the seeds, okay, a lot of the roots, especially the roots have a lot of sugar, tend to have higher problems with aflatoxins, all right? So from my experience um, in the last 25 years, these are some examples of herbs that are more likely to have aflatoxins. So once again, if the grower in China, when they are harvesting the herb, happens to be rainy season, okay, then there is a slightly higher chance that these herbs may have higher level of aflatoxins, all right? And aflatoxin is one of the most potent hepatotoxin and carcinogen in the world. So this is a test that we do have to make sure it's done. So the herbs will not create more problem than they are worth. Anyways, um, the general safety limit, according to the FDA, is it has to, be, it has to have less than 20 ppb, of aflatoxin in the US, okay? And then there's also the guideline by American Herbal Product Association and also European Pharmacia. Little bit different, but you have to meet at least the FDA guideline, all right? So this is an herb called Yenhus or Corydalis, actually one of the herbs that's most likely to have aflatoxin problem. So once again, uh, it should be tested. You know, we, we've actually tested on each and every batch of Yenhus 
to make sure it meets at a very minimum the FDA guidance. All right, whole crop toxin is another um, byproduct, micro mycotoxin byproduct. In this case, once again, found in food like grape juice, coffee, wine, beer, cereals, different type of nuts, okay, corn, peanuts, and so on, okay. Uh, aflatoxin was more toxic to the liver. Whole crop toxin is more toxic to the kidney. These are the three herbs, uh, Chinese herbs, that are more likely to have okra toxin, including gou qi zi, lai xian fru, gan cao licorice, and also zi gan cao, which is a honey processed licorice. All right. The European limit safety is 10 ppb. There's none from US FDA or ARPA. Okay, so in this case, um, ideally, uh, it should be tested and it should have less than 10 ppb. So once again, this is a lab test for zi gan cao baked licorice. And okra test results at the bottom, uh, less than 10 pb. All right, so that is a quick look into some of the many factors, okay, in our environment that when we are exposed to and gets into the body, start to accumulate, that may trigger the immune system to attack those chemicals and toxins. But in addition, not just those chemicals and toxins, but the tissues that in which those toxins are accumulated in, all right? So that is the beginning of the autoimmune disease, all right? So this is a passage from Ling Su, The Divine Pivot, that says, the skilled practitioner treats before an illness occurs, not once it has occurred, all right? So ideally, what you wanna do is when the patient starts to show initial signs and symptoms, or if the patient is exposed to those conditions on a re regular basis, you should raise the red flag and advise the patient to minimize the exposure or to avoid it if at all possible. So once again, you treat the problem before it happens. You treat it when it's still a small, mild signs and symptom, not when the problem become a full-blown disease. All right, so that is easier said than done. I know a lot of patients are not, you know, are very compliant. You know, so we do what we can, okay, but sometimes it does take a crisis before the patient is willing to engage and change their behavior, all right? So you do what you can and you help as many patients as you can, all right? So like I mentioned, the solution here is to try to identify what those path pathogens or chemicals and toxins are and try to avoid it, try to prevent it as much as possible. All right, so now um, in your handout that I share with Lhasa, which you also have it available, I have a long list of slides for the immune system. Uh, but for the seminar, I cut them out because we don't have time for it. But just remember the most important part here with the immune system is that you have your innate immunity and you also have your immunity. The innate immunity is your skin, your mucous membrane, your macrophage and your natural killer cells. So basically this is the generic immunity that you have to fight against everything, okay? And then uh, if they do their job, that's the end of infection, you know, it stops over there. But obviously every once in a while, um, the infection or the toxins get through and gets to the inside of the body. And that's when your acquired immunity kicks in. And this is basically a specific immunity Involving, involving T cells, B cells, and also humoral immunity in, involving antibodies. So these are very specific toward whatever the pathogen is, all right? And the reason this is important is because when we talk about uh, drugs, uh, you need to know what drugs they are and how they work as far as treating the autoimmune disease. And also, uh, if you are interested in learning the pharmacology of the herb, the pharmacology of the herb is becoming very sophisticated. In fact, they will identify how these herbs help to treat autoimmune disease. Do they work on macrophage or natural killer cells or certain T cell, B cell, or certain you know, um, antibody or cytokines or tumor necrosis factor? So the research of herbs have become very specific, okay, um, that you can pinpoint exactly how the herbs work. Okay, anyways, uh, this is one of the slides that I showed you earlier where the red flags represent all the possible causes of autoimmune disease. So in a healthy person, the immune system is able to fight them off and they don't get into the inside of the body. But then what happens is when the immune system is confused, 
then what happens is all these things start to accumulate in the body. And instead of the immune system fighting them off, the immune system is now attacking different tissues and different organs inside the body. And that is basically the conclusion by the immune, NIH, National Institute of Health, that for patients with autoimmune disease, the body's immune system, the body's army of white blood cells, instead of attacking the pathogens, they're attacking the body itself. All right. So this is basically what we are dealing with as far as autoimmune system, autoimmune disease goes. All right. So as far as the body, everything is fair game. Your brain, your eyes, your mouth, your spinal cords, your skin, your blood, and so on. Everything is fair game. Immune system can attack any part of the body depending on where the pathogen, the toxins, the chemical is trapped in. All right. And that is why in the very beginning, I show you slides or many disease because depending on where the immune system is attacking, that could be a different disease. All right. This is a from Dr. William Osler that says, the good physician treats a disease, the great physician treats a person who has a disease. All right, so we should always keep that in mind. When we are treating a patient, we have to look at the entire person, look at all the signs and symptoms, and treat the entire person, not just the signs and symptoms. All right, so in Chinese medicine, generally speaking, I would say we're pretty good at that. Western medicine sometimes tends to forget that because a lot of the drugs that they use tend to work on the molecular level to treat the problem, but they oftentimes forget the patient themselves. All right, so let me show you some of the drugs that are commonly used to treat autoimmune disease, then you'll see what I mean. All right, so as far as autoimmune disease goes, these are the three main category of drugs that are most frequently prescribed to treat autoimmune disease. The first one is corticosteroids, second one is immune suppressants, and the last one is biologics. Okay. Corticosteroids include prednisone, prednisolone, dexamethasone, triamcinolone, betamethasone, and so on. And basically, they are all steroids. And what they all do is they have a very broad and very potent effect to press inflammation. All right. Most doctors will tell you that they cannot imagine practicing Western medicine today without steroids as one of the drugs because it's very useful, it's very powerful, and it's great for treating acute, severe conditions. All right, so when the patient has an autoimmune disease, when their cells, immune cells, start to attack different parts of the body, one of the first things that, that it causes is it triggers severe local inflammation, right? And that's why when you look at a lot of the auto, autoimmune disease, the names will end with itis, okay? Whether it's bronchitis, arthritis, um, uh, enteritis, whatever. You know, ends with itis. This in Latin means to set on fire or inflammation. All right. So, a lot of the autoimmune disease, the symptom itself is inflammation and in parts of the body. And therefore, the immediate solution is to prescribe a powerful anti inflammatory agent. And steroids happens to be the most useful because it has a broad application, it's very powerful, and that's why it's used. But the problem is, while it's great for treating the acute inflammation, there's a lot of immediate and also long-term side effects. All right, the side effects include all the things that you see here, including suppressed immune system, elevated risk of infection, and that could include urinary tract infection, herpes, candidiasis, and so on, and then increased risk of osteoporosis, diabetes, and so on and so forth. And the main long-term risk, especially if you give it to children, is that use of the steroids will create a negative feedback system to the endocrine system. And that will then slow down or inhibit the endogenous production of the steroids. All right, so while you use steroids short term, it may be great for treating the symptom. But the long term problem is that when you discontinue the drug, the problem usually will come back and there will be a rebound, and the problem may be even worse than before. All right, so take another round of steroids, then there will be more suppression endogenously. And then you have this negative cycle, and eventually, and soon enough, the patient becomes dependent on steroids, and they cannot get off the steroids. All right, so if at all possible, it should be reserved 
for short-term use for acute and severe condition, ideally now for long-term use. All right. Immune suppressor, as the name implies, are drugs that suppress the immune system and the immune response. All right. So these are drugs such as methotrexate, cyclophosphamide, and also adacyoprim. Um, they are used to treat autoimmune disease. Uh, you will see them quite a bit given to patients who have just gotten a organ transplant. And the reason is because after you receive a organ transplant, a lot of the time your immune system sees this new organ as a foreign substance. So it tries to attack it and try to destroy it, right? So it's kind of like your immune system attacking your healthy tissue because there are some virus or toxins or chemicals. In any case, these are all the hyperactive immune response that the immune suppressants are prescribed to suppress these hyperactive immune response. All right. And then what happens is if these drugs are used, then obviously you will have a risk of bone marrow suppression because they suppress the immune system. There is a risk of liver and kidney damage. There's a higher risk of infection. There's a higher risk of cancer along with hair loss. All right, so once again, immune suppressants are very powerful. And if you do use it, it comes with significant side effects and toxicities. All right, and the last one are called the biologics. And these are the ones that are very, very specific. And they target a specific cell or a specific pathway of inflammation. All right, so the first one is Orencia, which is a T cell blocker. The second one is Rituxan, which is a B cell destroyer. And then lastly, you have Humira, Rimake, Embra, and so on, that are the entocytokines. Okay, so these are the ones that target a specific immune cell or immune um, chemical to block inflammation pathway. All right, so once again, you may think that the more specific it is, the more effective it is, and the more side effect, the less side effect it's going to cause. But unfortunately, that's not really the case because what happened is how safe can it be when you have a cell or when you have a drug that actually block the T cells and destroy the B cells? How can something like that not have significant side effect? And in fact, they do because the first one is these drugs are foreign substance. Okay, so the very intent of these drugs is to treat the autoimmune disease, but unfortunately, the hyperactive immune system may treat these drugs as a foreign agent, and those drugs become a trigger for another round of autoimmune disease. All right, so that is one possibility. In addition to that, there is possible immune suppression. There is a significant increase in risk of infection. There is blood disorder. And also, lastly, like I mentioned, you know, these drugs can also be an antibody that trigger a separate autoimmune reaction, all right? So uh, as you can see, autoimmune disease at this point in time is a very significant challenge to Western medicine, okay? They don't know exactly what's causing it. They have many different possibilities. They have many different causes. It's very hard to isolate exactly what chemical or trigger that cause it. And it's very hard to prescribe a drug that is safe and effective. In most cases, there's some effect, but at the same time, there is very significant toxicity associated with all the drugs. All right, so that is a dilemma, that is a major challenge, challenge facing Western medicine today. All right, and that's why for a lot of patients, um, they have gone through Western medicine, but unfortunately, they are not very happy with Western medicine. They are not very happy with drug, and the reason is simply because there are a lot of side effects associated with drug treatments. All right, so with that, let's turn the page and look at how Chinese medicine can be used to target Western medicine, all right? So this is a simplified pathway uh, of how um, autoimmune disease uh, happens in um, simple slides, uh, basically four or five phases. So you have pathogens, uh, that also refers to pathogens, microbes, toxins, chemicals, and so on, that initially is from the outside of the body. And in most cases, they try to get into the body, but they are bounced off, they are attacked, they are repelled by our innate immunity. Okay, so once again, that's your physical barrier, your skin, mucous membrane, and so on. 
or your cellular barrier, including macrophage and also NK cells. But again, uh, even though the innate immune response is sufficient to um, defend the body, uh, in some cases, in most cases, uh, they do get inside, either through the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we take, and so on, and they get inside the body. And once they get inside the body, they will slowly accumulate in different cells and tissues and organs and so on. And now your body switch gear and the T cells and B cells start to become involved. They will get to the chemicals and allergens. They will trigger acute inflammation, all right? And then the body, body's response will be redness, warmth, hotness, falling and pain at the local area. And the idea is you're trying to destroy the virus, the bacteria, the chemicals, the toxins, the allergens, and so on. So ideally, if the system does its job, the infection or the invasion ends right there. But if not, then what happens is those things then accumulate in the body. And then the immune system still continue to work. They still continue to try to break it down. But unfortunately, now what happens is the tissue starts to be destroyed. So you have cell lysis, which is a cell broken down and uh, destroyed. You have apoptosis, which is a macrophage eaten, eaten up these dead cells. The tissues are getting damaged and destroyed, so are the organs. And at some point, the destruction of the organ will lead to loss of the function and also loss of the organ physically itself. All right, so this is another quick explanation of what happens to acute to chronic inflammation in autoimmune disease conditions. Now, let's look at it from a TCM perspective. So the bacteria, virus, fungus, pesticide, allergen, chemical, toxins, and so on, think of these as the seven pathogenic factors, right, that we know. Wind, cold, heat, summer heat, damp, dryness, and so on, all right? So it's somewhat of a metaphoric term, but basically that's what it is, right? We think of uh, infection oftentimes as heat or summer heat, and that's what it is. A lot of um, the mold, you know, comes from damp and humid environment. And when they get to the body, they are interpreted as dampness. Okay, so in any case, these foreign um, pathogens basically are the seven pathogenic factors in TCM: wind, cold, heat, damp, heat, and so on. All right, your physical barriers, your skin, your mucous membrane, your macrophage, and so on, is basically our way chi or the defense chi. Okay, so this is the first defense to fight off against these pathogens. And if they do get into the inside of the body where T cells and B cells are activated, think of your zheng qi or your up qi basically as your T cell and B cells. All right, so once again, if you have sufficient wei qi or if you have sufficient zheng qi, generally speaking, you will not have a disease condition. It will fight off and keep you healthy. All right, then <coughs> your acute inflammatory response including redness, warmth, swelling, and pain corresponds to TCN concepts such as heat, fire, damp and phlegm, and then pain, of course, is chi stagnation and blood stasis, right? So uh, when you see a patient with such acute inflammatory signs and symptoms, you need to prescribe corresponding herbs to clear heat, clear fire, dry dampness, eliminate phlegm, and then move chi and blood, okay? And then if the Q is not treated properly, then it becomes chronic. Then what happens is the chronic inflammation, like we mentioned, is characterized by the damage of the cells and tissues, right? So what happens is when you think about yin and yang, yin represents the anatomy, yang represents the physiology, or you can think of them as form and function, all right? So yin and the balance in terms of anatomy and physiology is when the yin is damaged, okay, your anatomy, your cells, your tissue, the actual physical parts of the body is damaged, okay? So that's yin deficiency, all right? So once again, um, well, let's, let's give you another example. Think of somebody with autoimmune hypothyroid, right? So usually what happens is your immune system is attacking and destroying the thyroid gland. Right, so literally, your thyroid gland is going through atrophy, going through damage, and it's literally physically it's getting smaller and smaller. Right, so that is insufficiency, 
and then at some point, once the gland is damaged to a, a, a certain extent, the disease becomes irreversible and the thyroid gland may be completely gone. So once the gland is damaged and gone, then obviously it cannot perform the function. And the function is to produce thyroid hormone. So at that point, you have lack of thyroid hormone. And what does thyroid hormone do? It stimulates and regulates the body's metabolism. Right, so that's the young energy of the body represented by the thyroid hormone. Okay, so once you have destruction of thyroid gland, that's insufficiency, you have lack of thyroid hormone, and then the lack of thyroid hormone is a young deficiency. So now in chronic inflammatory phase of autoimmune disease, you will have both deficiency and young deficiency. In deficiency, once again, is a destruction of the tissues and the organs, and young deficiency is a loss of functions. All right, so you are both, and that's why, once again, yin and yang often go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. You cannot have yin deficiency without some yang deficiency, and you cannot have yang deficiency without some yin deficiency. All right, so now to look at it more specifically in a pattern differentiation perspective, right? These are three of the main pattern differentiation in TCM. The first one is the six channels, Liu Jing Bian Zheng, from Tai Yang, Yang Ming, Sao Yang, Tai Yin, Sao Yin, and Jue Yin. This is primarily used to do the co pattern differentiation. So, not as useful here because autoimmune disease is primarily Xi pattern. All right. The next one is Wei Qi Yin Xue Bian Zheng, so the defense Qi, defense level. Qi level, nutritive level, and blood level differentiation. I think this is the best way to use, guideline to use, to differentiate autoimmune disease. Okay. The last one is San Jiao Bian Zheng, which is the upper burner, middle burner, and lower burner. That's not as useful either because that's good for determining the location of the disorder, but not so much the progression of the disease itself. All right. So let's look at it on the uh, four levels, Wei, Qi, Ying, Xue. And this will help you to now put the autoimmune disease into much better categories in terms of disease pressure. All right, so once again, on your left-hand side, you have the simple uh, model of pathogen to immunity to destruction. And if you look at it from a TCM perspective, again, pathogens is your wind, cold, damp, and so on, all right? Your initial innate immunity is your Wei Qi, Wei defense level. Your acute inflammation, where there's a lot of heat and fire, is your Qi energy level, right? So if you remember uh, in TCM uh, etiology or TCM theory, the Qi level, this, this order is characterized with a lot of bigs, right? The big sweating, the big heat and fire, the big pause and so on. So that's what happened. The patient is in acute inflammatory phase. The entire immune system is engaged in a full-blown battle with the pathogen. Everything is elevated. And that's why you have all the heat and heat and inflammation and so on. All right. And if the disease goes past that point, now you end up with chronic inflammatory phase. So the inflammation continues, but now it's a low-grade inflammation. There's a lot of underlying indeficiency, a lot of destruction of the cells and tissues. And that's basically your in nutritive phase and also your blood phase. All right. So once again, um, if you are more of a words person, right, you know, I put this into nice blocks, right? So once again, the way law is when the chi, when the pathogens attack the body surface, you have these signs and symptoms, you have the innate immunity fighting off the disease. If the disease goes to the chi level, and this is a you know pathogens moving interior, now dealing with the B cells and T cells, and you have you know high fever, sweating, big paws, and so on and so forth. All right, and once it goes to the yin and xue level, and that's when the immune system breaks down. You have a lot of damage the all tissues to the organs, and lastly, when it's the blood phase, then tissue damage. It's then translated into fibrosis, scar tissue formation. Basically, the live, healthy cells got damaged, and then they got replaced by scar tissues, by fibrosis. Okay, and then the organ simply lost function. Right. So imagine, right, if the patient has chronic lung problem. 
okay? And the lung is supposed to be nice and flexible so it can expand and contract and get the air in. Uh, but the uh, uh, lung has been attacked by the immune system leading to scar tissue, leading to fibrosis. Well, it's lost its function. It can no, long, no longer do what it's supposed to do. And that's the same with the liver. If the patient has hepatofibrosis, fibrosis, you know, basically the healthy liver is replaced by scar tissues, it's no longer able to carry its function. And that's why Xue blood level is the last phase of Wei Qi Ying Xue Bian Bian Zheng. You know, it's the last phase. You know, at that point, you have scar tissue, you have fibrosis, the organ loses the function, and it is now irreversible. All right. So once again. You try, you want to try to catch the disease and treat the patient as early as possible. And if you don't, at a certain point, the disease becomes irreversible and there's not much you can do. All right. This is another illustration that I did uh, to quickly sum up um, what exactly happens. You know, so if you are more of a very visual person, hopefully this helps. All right. So the picture with a lot of sharp ends on the outside or the circle represents all the pathogen that cause autoimmune disease, right? And the circle, dotted circle, represents your uh, immune system, right? And it's dotted circle and it has pores, and that's because these pathogens can possibly in enter our body, all right? So you have skin, which is Wei Qi, you have your Zheng Qi, which is your T cells and B cells, and you also have your mucous membrane. Every once in a while, the bacteria, the virus, and the toxins get into the body, and that starts to create the acute inflammatory response. So you start with Wei level, goes to Qi level, goes to Ying level, goes to Xie level, all right? Generally speaking, it's a going in that circle, but it doesn't have to be, all right? So the disease may go from Wei to Qi to Ying, but if you start to intervene three, the arrow can go the other way around, meaning the patient as they improve will then turn from in level to chi level and then back to way level and eventually out of the body. So I purpose, purposely put the arrows on both ends because it's not a one directional thing, it can go both ways, all right? But if the disease is not treated, then what happened is all these four stages, right, is characterized by excess heat or deficiency heat. And if not treated over time, the heat will slowly cause indeficiency. So that is what you have in the middle. All cases of autoimmune disease will have these two things in common. They will always have heat, whether it's excess heat or deficiency heat, and they will all have indeficiency. So make sure you remember that. All autoimmune disease will have heat and indeficiency. So you have to treat both of those factors, all right? And then a lot of times you also have damp and phlegm, and this happens as the macrophage start to eat the bacteria, the virus, or the damaged cells. It eats it, you un unclose it, and then it becomes a lot of the dead phlegm, all right? So that, once again, has to be treated, has to be eliminated, okay? And you can do it with herbs that dry dampness and eliminate phlegm. Okay, and then what happened is a lot of time when the tissues are damaged and destroyed, it causes a lot of local pain, and that is your blood stasis, blood stagnation. And then finally, as you can see in the middle, the indeficiency expands, right? So as a disease becomes worse and worse, the organ is being destroyed, and that's why the circle of indeficiency gets bigger. When indeficiency gets to a certain point where the organ lost the function, now you have qi deficiency and yang deficiency. Basically, the function of the organ has been lost. All right. So this is another way to illustrate what happens. All right. So once again, when you see these patients with autoimmune disease, oftentimes when they're in, they will have all these problems already. Unfortunately, they don't come in when they have problem at the beginning. But generally speaking, when they come in, they already have, they already know they have the problem. They have gone to Western medicine. They have already, already gotten a diagnosis from you know medical doctor that they have Reynolds, they have Hashimoto's, they have Graves' disease, they have uh, whatever they have, right? So now they want you to treat them. Okay, so we don't end up with the simple cases. We end up with the most severe cases. So these are the seven general principles you want to keep in mind. Number one, you want to try to identify 
what the pathogen, what the cause is, and eliminate the exposure as much as possible. Number two, whatever that's already accumulated in the body, you need to use herbs for detox so you can get rid of those toxins and pathogens out of the body. Because if you don't, you're always going to be doing band-aid therapy, always just treating the symptoms. All right. You need to clear heat, clear the excess heat to treat the acute inflammation, clear the chronic, clear the deficiency heat to treat the chronic inflammation. So you need to do both. Excess heat for acute inflammation, deficiency heat for chronic inflammation. You need to nourish in so the body can repair the damage to the tissues and to the organs. You need to move the blood so it can get rid of the scar tissue, get rid of the fibrosis. You need to dry the dampness and eliminate the phlegm. And then lastly, tonify qi and yang to restore the normal functions. So these are the seven things to keep in mind as you put together the herbal formula to treat the entire person, not just one part of the body that went wrong. All right, so really treat the entire person. These are all seven things you have to keep in mind. All right, here is another nice passage from Huang Di Nei Jing, Yellow Emperor in the Classic. The sage does not wait for the disease to occur before treating it. It takes preventive measure in advance. To resort to treatment when a disease has already occurred is like digging a well when one is dying of thirst. Early is it not then too late? All right, so once again, unfortunately, that's in most cases where we are in terms of treating patients with autoimmune disease. All right. And once again, it could be any of these organs, okay, that's affected. All right. So now uh, we have a little bit of time. Chances are I'm going to go over one word. Um, so if you can, hang with me. Uh, we'll go through three specific examples of autoimmune disease. Uh, we'll quickly go through renal, Reynolds disease, Sjogren's disease, or Sjogren's syndrome, and also Hashimoto thyroiditis. So you can see how those seven general principles apply specifically to treating an autoimmune disease. All right, so Reynolds disease is basically a disorder characterized by vasospastic attack of the blood vessels, leading to localized paler and coldness of the finger, toes, ears, nose, and so on. And this is something that was first described by a French doctor called Dr. Reynolds, and that's why the disease is named after him. And as the blood vasospasms occur, initially you may see cold fingers. And if you see the upper slide here, it is very obvious. Okay, some of the fingers are affected, the rest of, one, the rest of them are not, all right? So there's localized ischemia along with pale skin, cold fingers, stabbing pain, numbness, and rigidity of the fingers. And as the disease progresses, then what happened is the nerves start to die, okay? And that's why you have swelling, you have purplish discoloration of the hands, turning blue, turning dark brown, sharp stabbing pain, right? So those of us who are TCM practitioners, how would you diagnose these fingers? How would you, how would you diagnose these patients? It's very obvious that this is a blood stagnation condition, right? So once again, uh, you don't need to panic like the deer in front of the headlights. You know, step back, look at the signs and symptoms. Um, there are some cases that are going to be very simple, and there are some that may be more complicated. But if you follow the TCM paradigm, um, generally speaking, you won't get too lost. Okay. Anyhow, uh, Western medicine generally says the cause is unknown because there is not a clear cause and effect type of relationship. But rather, there are many things that will all contribute to this condition, including emotional stress, chronic exposure to cold environment, smoking, physical injury, any drugs that are more likely to cause blood vessel to constrict, okay, along with certain chemicals such as polyvinyl chloride, all right? Um, and then um, this is some pathology with Western medicine. Basically, the immune system attack the blood vessels, causing blood constriction, less blood circulation to, the, to those areas, along with increase in platelet act activation, increase in viscosity of the blood, impaired breakdown of the blood clots. But the bottom line is poor blood circulation to the peripheral parts of the body, leading to those local area damages, okay? Western men, of course, often uh, rely on some type of lab test 
to confirm the diagnosis. So in this case, the antibodies, uh, ESRs, and so on. Okay, in Chinese medicine, uh, blood stagnation is a problem that is well documented. So this is a passage from 1742 that says, in blood vessel B, painful obstruction syndrome of the blood, blood does not flow harmoniously in the vessels, leading to a change in color. All right, so this is somewhat similar to what we're looking at as far as renal syndrome goes. All right, so if we look at the diagram that I showed earlier, the biggest part in the middle here is the blood station. That is the most important thing you want to focus on. And as blood stations block the blood circulation, there is localized cold because warmth does get there. There's qi stagnation and blood stasis with pain. There's also insufficiency where the local tissues start to become damaged. So those are the main thing we want to look at in addition to the heat factors. All right. So mostly blood stasis is the main problem. And obviously blood stasis can be accompanied by qi stagnation with cold, with insufficiency and so on. And if you treat these patients, obviously you need to consider and definitely use the blood moving formula. All right, so these are examples of blood moving formulas that we have all studied in school. All right, so you have xue fu zu yu tang, drive out blood stasis in the mention of blood action. So this is best for blood stasis in the upper jaw. Okay, so your chest area. You have ge xia zu yu tang, drive out blood stasis below the diaphragm. And this is best for blood stasis in the middle jaw. You have sao fu zu yu tang, drive out blood stasis in the lower abdominal region. So this is best for the lower abdominal cap area. You have sen tong zu yu tang, drive out blood stasis from, for a painful body decoction. This is best for all the extremities, your arms and legs, your limbs, peripheral parts of the body. And lastly, tao hong si zu tang, for substance decoction with safflower and peach pit. And this is for patients with blood deficiency, blood stagnation at the same time. So I would say for renal syndrome, where it's generally the peripheral parts of the body that's affected, Sen Tong Zu Yu Tang, the fourth one on the top is the best choice because it most specifically focuses on the peripheral parts of the body. All right, and these are the other formulas you can combine if there are other complications, okay? And if you put together a formula from single herbs, all right, then as you choose which herbs to use, which blood moving herbs to use, this is something interesting to keep in mind. Uh, we have 30, 40, if not more, blood moving herbs. Some of the blood moving herbs have high coagulant effect. Some of them have antiplatelet effect. Some of them have anti-thrombotic effect. Some of them have anti-inflammatory effect. Right. So when you are treating patients with autoimmune disease with renal syndrome where there's a lot of underlying inflammation. Okay. These six herbs are definitely herbs you want to use because they are blood moving herbs that also have anti-inflammatory effect. All right. So generally what that means is these are blood moving herbs that are probably cold in nature that will reduce inflammation. And if you use these herbs, you will get much better results because you are literally killing two birds with one stone. You're moving the blood, you're improving blood circulation, you're also treating inflammation at the same time. You try not to use blood moving herbs that are warm or hot, because warm or hot herbs may actually cause the inflammatory condition to get worse. Right, does that make sense? Right, so these are the herbs to use if you put together your own herbal formula from scratch using single herbs, all right? Diet-wise, it's also very important. Make sure the patient don't eat a lot of cold and cool foods because they are likely to impair uh, blood circulation. So I know there's a heat wave right now everywhere in the US. If that's the case, still don't eat cold drinks, don't drink ice water, don't drink iced tea. That will just make it worse. And at the same time, don't eat a lot of hot and spicy foods because hot and spicy foods usually will make inflammatory conditions worse. So rather, eat neutral temperature foods, such as green, leafy vegetables, black jolly, fungus, coarse food and grains, and so on, porridge. All, all right, lifestyle. Uh, exercise regularly to improve circulation, keep the body warm, avoid exposure to cold, and stop drinking and 
control stress. All right. Next one quickly is the Sjogren syndrome, and this is an immune disorder characterized by two main things: dry eyes, dry mouth, and also dry mucous membrane. So actually, three main things: dry eyes, dry mouth, and also dry mucous membranes. And this is something that was first described by a doc Swiss Swedish doctor called Dr. Sjogren, and he noticed that a group of women who tend to have these three things at the same time: dry eyes, dry mouth, and also poly. Once again, it's the immune system attacking the mucous membrane, attacking the eyes, attacking the mouth, attacking the joints all at the same time. All right. So once again, these are the general signs and symptoms. Dry eyes due to destruction of the lacrimal glands. Dry mouth due to destruction of the salivary glands. Skin rash, dry skin, vaginal dryness, dry cough because of the dry in the lung. And joint pain, swelling, and stiffness. Right. Once again, Western medicine causes are known. Risk factors include many that we discussed earlier: bacteria, virus, toxins, smoking, air travel, and so on. And once again, uh, pathology is the immune system trigger. Then, in turn, attacking the mucous membrane, attacking the glands, tear glands, and salivary glands. Diagnosis in Western medicine is mostly with lab antibodies. And in this case, Western medicine does what TCM does. Tongue diagnosis, right? So the patient has a dry mouth, has reduced saliva production. Generally speaking, mouth is going to be dry, the tongue coat is going to be dry, right? So if you look at this, this is obviously body fluid deficiency and also insufficiency in Chinese medicine. So once again, you will use herb that promote the generation of fluid and also nourish in. All right. So once again, this is something that's well documented in Chinese medicine. This is a passage from 1916 that pathogenic dryness will damage lung channel, damage stomach fluids, and finally liver, blood, and kidney yin. Therefore, dry symptoms can be related to damage of the zhang fu organs, primarily lung, stomach, and kidney. So as you treat these patients with Sjogren's syndrome, insufficiency is going to be the most important thing. Lung insufficiency, stomach insufficiency, and liver and kidney insufficiency. All right. If you want to be more specific, dry eye is lung insufficiency. Dry mouth is stomach in. Dry skin is lung in. Uh, cough is lung in. And then vaginal dryness is kidney in. And the rest of the internal organs, uh, most likely, is also kidney in. All right. So depending on what pattern the patient shows, then once again, you can pick your formula accordingly. All right, so Qing Zhao Jiu Fei Tang or Bai He Gu, Gu Jin Tang is good for lung insufficiency. Then stomach insufficiency can be treated with Yu Ni Jian, Mai Men Dong Tang, Sa Shen Mai Dong Tang, Ze Ye, Zheng Ye Cheng Qi Tang, and so on. Liver and kidney insufficiency can be treated with Liu Wei Di Huang Wan, Qu Ji Di Huang Wan, and so on. All right, so these are classic formulas that nourish liver and kidney insufficiency. If the patient shows some blood stasis, then Xue Fu Zhu Yu Tang is good. Drive out stasis in the mansion of the blood. And once again, uh, for those of you who are interested in pharmacology of the herb, these are the inner herbs that have also been shown to specifically stimulate the salivary glands and lacrimal glands to help to produce more tears and more saliva. All right, so once again, if you know the patient has a Sjogren syndrome, and you're putting the formula from scratch, these are the herbs you definitely want to incorporate. Or if you are you start with a classic formula, but the patient has severe insufficiency, once again, these are the single herbs you can add to the classic formula to increase the potency and also the, the focus to treat whatever you want to treat. Okay, so most of these herbs are in nourishing herbs or body fluid generating herbs, okay? Some are pure in tonic, some nourish in and clear deficiency heat, so you can pick and choose whatever is most suitable for what you are treating. Okay, so these are last some information about diet you should keep in mind and advise your patients, as well as lifestyle. Okay, so these are self-explanatory. I don't want to spend too much time on that. And last one is going to be Hashimoto thyroiditis. Okay, so once again, this is a 
autoimmune disease in which the auto the immune system the hi is hyperactive is attacking the thyroid gland eventually leading to um, destruction of the thyroid gland and also hypothyroidism and this is called Hashimoto's because it was first described by a Japanese physician that noticed that the destruction of the thyroid gland along with lymphocytic infiltration, necrosis, and pyrochyma atrophy. All right, so once again, these are the signs and symptoms for patients that have Hashimoto's, okay? Cause once it is unknown, but it's closely linked to virus, bacteria, heredity, sex, age, and so on, okay? Pathology is that once again, you have activated hyperactive immune system. Too much T cells, T helper cells, too much B cells, too much antibodies, and so on. All right, this is the Western diagnostic criteria. And from a TCM perspective, uh, once again, like we mentioned, the destruction of the thyroid gland itself is efficiency, but most of the signs and symptoms is going to be qi and yang deficiency. So the low energy and the low metabolism, that is your spleen and yang deficiency, okay? And then your low thyroid hormone, there your um, reduced function of the thyroid hormone is going to be mainly kidney chi and kidney yang deficiency. All right. So as far as diagnosis for these patients go, initially you have a lot of inflammation, but underneath you have in, in deficiency that are presented with thyroid gland destruction. You have chi and yang deficiency that is represented by lack of thyroid hormone, and then with some phlegm stagnation and blood station. All right, so that's how you want to treat the entire person with thyroid, Hashimoto thyroiditis. All right, so the primary formulas to use, these are, these are the two most important formula. One is Jin Gui Shen Qi Wan, Kidney Qi Pill from the Golden Cabinet. I would say this formula is about moderately warm in nature. So if the patient has a moderate, hypothyroid, this will be fine. If the patient has a severe hyperthyroid, then you want to use Dao Wei Di Huang Wan, which is the A ingredient with Romania formula. All right, and the reason is because Zhou Gui and Fu Zi have great effect to elevate metabolism, but also to stimulate the endocrine system as well as the thyroid gland to produce more thyroid hormone, okay? If the patient only has early stage fatigue and tiredness, then spleen qi and yang tonic formula will be fine. Spleen si jun zi tang, four gentlemen's decoction, and also liu jun zi tang, six gentlemen's decoction. Okay, if the patient has underlying indeficiency, you can use liu wei di huang wan, okay, or um, da, da bu yin wan, any of the kidney and tonics will be fine. All right, if the patient has goiter, these are the herbs that you eliminate phlegm that will help to reduce and strip goiter. And then share food to return for plus stasis if necessary. All right, so once again, some tips on dietary and lifestyle. So once again, they are self-explanatory. Um, if they are not for some reason, uh, send me an email. In this particular case, you want to be careful because uh, if you do see spleen qi deficiency, spleen yang deficiency, and decide to use qi tonic, okay, they are two herbs you probably want to be careful using. Okay, so let's see if um, we have somebody who can type in the chat room and you know what those two herbs are that you want to be careful with. All right, so once again, qi tonic, you want to be careful if the patient has Hashimoto's thyroiditis or autoimmune disease as a whole. Anybody? Going once, going twice? Okay. Anyway, so two herbs are Huangqi, correct? Astragalus. And the other one is Zensen, Ginseng. Okay, and the reason is because Zensen and Huangqi are two of the tonic herbs that are known to also boost the immune system. So if their immune activity is really low, that's perfectly fine. But if you boost the immune too much with those two herbs, you may trigger the immune to become hyperactive. All right, so ideally, okay, instead of using Zensen, you should use Xi Yang Sen, American Sen, or Dang Sen, Coronapsis. They will still tonify Qi, 
but they won't boost the immune system as much. That way, you can treat the tiredness and the fatigue without worry about the side effect of boosting the immune system too much. And good job, J.A. Sanchez, for getting both right. Very good. All right, so now some current event before we wrap up the day. Um, there are two herbs that have been in the news quite a bit, uh, Chinese herbs specifically for treating auto autoimmune disease. Now, I want you to know at least a little bit about it. Uh, so you know when the patient come in and inquire about these two herbs uh, as far as whether they are right for you or for the patient. The first herb is an herb called Lei Gong Teng, uh, generally, generally known as Terigium, and also the Thunder God Vine. And there are a lot of research that shows these herb, these, this herb to have excellent immune suppressant effect to treat different type of rheumatoid disease. So this is a article that was published on the effect of traditional anti-rheumatic herbal medicine on immune response. Two herbs specifically are Lei Gong Teng and also Fang Qi. Anyways, if you're interested, uh, the references is listed, you can, you can go and bring it up. All right. So Lei Gong Teng, like I mentioned, has a lot of different study, a lot of different re reference. Not only that one, this is one specifically on its effect as an immune suppressant herb and also anti-rheumatic herb in fact with comparable efficacy to many of the drugs and not only is it a pharmacological study there's actually a lot of clinical studies so this is a multi-center open label random randomized and controlled study with 207 patients so that's actually a decent sized study they are comparing treatment of rheumatoid arthritis with lake by itself methotrexate by itself and the combination of lake and methotrexate and once again they showed that Lei Gong Teng to be quite effective, and combination of the two, two had less side effect than methotrexate by itself. And in addition to just rheumatoid arthritis, they also find Lei Gong Teng to be effect for, effect for treating polycystic kidney disease. All right, and this is a study done by Yale Medical School. So obviously, you know, a study with significant weight. All right, so if you're wondering, how come we don't hear more about this herb at school? How come we don't learn about this herb? The reason is because this herb historically is described, or, or is also named as qi bu shi, which literally means seven steps to death, trying to describe how toxic it is. Okay, so the toxicities include location to the GI tract, damage to the central nervous system, internal bleeding, necrosis of the organ, and so on and so forth. You can read on your own, there's quite a bit. Okay, so this is why, uh, this herb historically is not used a lot because of toxicity. You know, if you're using it to treat arthritis, it's really not a good idea. There are many other herbs available to treat arthritis. What happens is, if you have a very difficult condition like an autoimmune disease, then with the severity of the disease, possibly the side effect may be worthwhile. But nonetheless, before the patient or you consider whether or not to use this herb, Make sure you understand what all the toxicities are. And in addition, if that can happen to show any of those toxicity, these are the general ways to detox the patient and treat the side effect and adverse reactions. All right. So I think the antidotes are self-explanatory. And what's also interesting is in addition to these herbal antidotes, if you were to read Ben Chao Gang Mu, which is on uh, the Grand Materica, it lists, it lists a very effective herbal or well, very effective antidote and that antidote is the blood of rabbits and goats that eat lei gong teng on a regular basis as food okay so let me repeat that the one of the best antidote is to drink the blood of the rabbits and goats that eat tryptorigium as food on a regular basis and the reason is because these rabbits and goats, even though they eat tryptorigium on a regular basis, they are absolutely perfectly fine. There's no toxicity whatsoever. And the reason is because they have developed antibodies, so they are not harmed by the toxicity of the plant. So what you are looking for in acute cases is if you drink the blood, you are taking the antibody from these animals to counter the toxicity of the plant uh, in cases of overdose. And that may sound very barbaric and medieval, but that's exactly how Western medicine obtained a lot of the antidotes for snake anti-venom 
or any of the other uh, antidotes. Okay, so this is actually a great strategy in terms of treating patients. A side note here is, uh, I don't believe triterigium growth in North America. So if the animals do not eat these plants, there will be no antibody in their blood, and even if in the blood, it won't work. All right, so by all means, use the herb, don't use the plants, or don't use the blood. The other reason I take time to talk about it is because um, these articles, in fact, are all over the internet. And because of that, the products are also all over the internet, all right? So if you were to type in Triterigium at Amazon or at Google, well, guess what? You can get Dr. God Vine Root at a 20 to one extract, okay? Personally, I cannot imagine using it as a 21 to 20 to one extract. I don't know how potent or how toxic it may be. All right, so like I said, uh, make sure you are the expert in these things um, before you counsel the patients. Otherwise, uh, if the patient just take it on their own, buy it on their own, once again, they might do a lot more harm than good. All right, one other current event is an herb called Changsan Dictura root. Uh, this is another herb we don't use a lot in TCM because this is an anti-emetic herb. Okay, this is an herb that's used, you know, it's an emetic herb. It's an emetic herb to induce vomiting in cases of poisoning, all right? So when was the last time you had to induce vomiting with an herb because the patient got poisoning? Chances are not very often, and that's why we don't really use this herb. But what they have found is there's one compound in this herb called halofuginone that inhibits e helper cell 17 to suppress the immune system to treat autoimmune disease you know, it, uh, disease. They have found it to be very effective as an anti-inflammatory and also immune suppressant agent. And in fact, it has garnered so much traction that the Harvard Medical School is doing research on this exact compound, right? So um, this is an ongoing event and that's why it's a current event. Where it's gonna go, it's hard to say. But generally speaking, overdose of the herb will lead to a lot of side effects. Obviously, the most common, most expected is going to be nausea, vomiting, right? Of course, it's the medical herb, abdominal pains, and so on. All right, so before the patient uses this herb, before you use this herb, make sure you read about it. You know exactly what the effects are and side effects are. Otherwise, you're going to get into trouble. All right, so once again, if you do somehow decide to use the herb, these are the classic herbal antidotes that can be used to treat the tox toxicities or the adverse reactions associated with the herb, all right? So have this ahead of time uh, in case you need them, all right? So once again, um, these products are easily available over the counter through the internet. You can buy them on Amazon. You can buy them just about everywhere. So once again, I don't know if all these publicity is a blessing or is a curse, okay? So I think that is uh, something that we we'll have to wait and see. All right, so last part that I uh, want to uh, impart upon you before, before we wrap up the class is that it's not just the physical um, pathogens that trigger autoimmune disease, not just the virus, bacteria, chemical, toxins, and so on. Chronic stress also trigger the release of interleukin-6, which has a strong pro-inflammatory effect. All right, so by all means, it's very important to treat the body and also to treat the mind, okay? Mind, body, and soul is really all together. You cannot have one without the other, all right? This is a passage from Yellow Emperor's in the clinic. I'll leave you to read this on your own. So in the end, as you treat the patient, don't just treat their body, don't just treat them with herbal acupuncture. Make sure you treat the entire person. Make sure that they exercise on a regular basis. Exercise is a great way for the body to readjust itself. So the body can literally help itself to heal itself, okay? Exercise is very important. Make sure they have regular sleep, ideally seven or eight hours of sleep per night. And then this is for the body, for the mind. Uh, they can pray, okay? Or they can meditate, whatever they need to do to get the peace of mind. Once again, that's very, very important for management of stress. And then lastly, I will give you the everlasting TCM concept. And this is where we all started with the yin and yang balance, right? So in a normal person, your yin and yang are balanced, okay? And then gradually as we all get older, 
uh, your yang, generally speaking, will still remain somewhat balanced, but your yin will slowly deteriorate or slowly decrease below the par, right? And then what happened is for a patient that have acute inflammatory disease, their yang will be so much higher than their yin. Okay, so yang is about double, yin is about half. So this is what happens in acute inflammatory state of autoimmune disease. And then as they pass that, when it becomes more chronic, then yang is about 50% over, but yin becomes even less. You're looking at maybe 50%, 25% or less. All right. And that then is signed, signed, summed up by one of my favorite TCM practitioner called Zhu Dan Qi. And his most famous adage is yin yang chang you yu, yin chang bu zhu which means yang is often in excess and yin is often insufficient. And I think this is, once again, the last, the most important one thing you want to remember when you treat autoimmune disease. So once again, the hyperactive immune system itself is acute, inflammation is heat. Chronic disease is chronic inflammation, also chronic uh, deficiency heat. But underneath all the key signs and symptoms, you will always have indeficiency. So make sure when you are treating acute heat or acute heat or excess heat or deficiency heat, you always have some herbs to nourish in. Otherwise, if you just use bitter and cold curing herb, you will actually destroy in further and make the disease worse. All right. So um, I actually cram in about these three hours worth of material into about an hour and a half, okay? But like I said, um, this is really not enough for you to have a complete understanding of autoimmune disease. Uh, if you would learn more, uh, you can go to elotus.org, okay? And there you can find the entire eight hour class on archive, okay? And I'll type it on there. Um, so if you see a lot of these conditions, by all means, I would strongly encourage you to watch the entire class. That way you can get the most out of it. And if you have any questions on this class or later on you want to get hold of me, then you can contact me at my email, which is john.chen at evherbs.com. Okay, so uh, Jeffrey, do we have any time to take questions or uh, is everybody kind of tired, want to wrap it up and go home? <laughs> well, it's completely up to you. If you're willing to answer a couple of questions, we have some very good ones here. Um, okay. Do you have a couple we'll minutes? A, yeah, we'll take a couple of questions, sure. All right, and anything else that doesn't get answered, are you willing it, for me to send them to you and have you answer them afterwards? Sure, be happy to. Perfect. All right, well, let's start. Looks like Marissa would like to know, how do you handle a complex situation like autoimmune dust and infection, in particular SLE and Epstein-Barr? Well, generally speaking, the idea is when you have acute situations, you need to treat the acute condition first. And then once the acute situation subsides, then you treat the underlying problem. All right. So uh, if the patient has acute flare-up of the immune system, then you need to set the immune system first. If they have an infection first, then you treat the immune system infection first. And then once again, if you're treating infection, uh, in Chinese medicine, infection itself is heat, right? So you're looking at heat at different places, maybe lung heat, maybe dampy in the lower jaw, or lung heat would be lung infection, uh, dampy in the lower jaw would be maybe urinary tract infection. Uh, so you want to use heat curing herb. And if you want to be even more specific, uh, you want to see uh, exactly which herb it is that whatever bacteria or virus it is right so a lot of research have been done to say to see you know this herb is good against staphylococcus this herb is good against streptococcus some herbs are good against um, herpes simplex some herbs are good against whatever virus so it depends on how general or how specific you want to be with your herbal formula selection all right. Well, that was a great answer. Thank you. Uh, last next question is from Susanna. She would like to know how do I help a postmolar pregnancy IBS patient who has a fructose allergy? Um, can you repeat the question again? She said, "How do I help a postmolar pregnancy IBS patient who also has a fructose allergy?" Um, that I think I need to get a lot more detailed information. It's hard to. Um, 
recommend something generic like this. So uh, have her send me an email and um, we'll get into more detailed, specific discussion. All right, Susanna, his email address is in the uh, chat. So please feel free to send John an email. Uh, it looks like Jess would like to know, how do you work with Lyme disease type cases where the pain might oscillate between acute and chronic presentations? Well, this is one of those things that I mentioned earlier that um, there is no good solution either Western medicine or Chinese medicine. You know, so both medicines at this point in time is struggling with how to best treat Lyme disease. Okay, so at this point, um, there is no set protocol, not that I know of. Um, the best you can do is start with some antibiotic groups, uh, see how the patient responds. And then if they have a lot of chronic inflammatory conditions, then once again, use heat chlorine herbs. Ideally, that will, that will clear heat and nourish in at the same time. But don't use one that are bitter and cold and it will dry up even further. Now, so I think that's one condition where we are all on the same boat as we, in a way, experiment, try different things until we find something that really works. All right. Uh, Monica would like to know, how do you treat a patient with IBS with diarrhea predominant who is also dealing with chronic bacterial prostate, uh, prostatitis, prostatitis. The patient is getting ready to do a 30-day round of antibiotics for the prostatitis, but this will damage their stomach and GI system. Okay, so like I said, you know, uh, at the very beginning, uh, autoimmune is very, very complicated, and you know, obviously the reason is because um, you have so many factors that are involved, and at the time when the immune system becomes hyperactive, it's going to attack many different parts of the body. You know, so uh, I think the most important takeaway message is this one-hour class is not enough for complete understanding. Okay, and that's why I did an eight-hour class uh, for this specific topic. There are also, in fact, many excellent books uh, that you can read on, and this is specifically TCM books on how to treat autoimmune disease, you know. So once again, um, when I post something, you know, then I'll post all the books along with uh, the questions and answers. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, again, you know, this these specific patient-related questions, um, you need to look at the entire person, you know. So once again, send me an email directly, and then I can give you much better uh, answers. Perfect. Okay. So, so actually, the next question... Okay, now we'll do one more, but it, it seems like most of these questions are from practitioners that have a specific patient in mind. And usually if you have a specific question in my patient in mind, then the best treatment is not a generic treatment like this, but I need to know all the signs and symptoms and so do you. Do a TCM differential diagnosis and then you know come up with the best treatment. Perfect. All right. Well, everybody has Dr. Chen's email, which is john.chen at evherbs.com. Uh, Dr. Sanchez asked if you have a book, and I gave him links to two books from you. Um, you might want to maybe talk about those briefly, and we can let everybody go for the evening. All right. So those books. Okay, so these are the references I use for today's class. Okay. As these books go. Oh, how come they are not here? Anyways, one is Chinese medical herbology and pharmacology, uh, and the other one is Chinese herbal forms and applications. Uh, so the first book is on single herb. The second book is on herbal formulas. And if you're interested, they are both available at aompress.com. And for your information, if you are still a student or if you are out for a while, both of those books are required textbooks by both California Acupuncture Board and NCCAM uh, as textbooks. Um, and my approach to writing both books is to integrate Chinese herbology and Western pharmacology. Very much like how I'm teaching this class. So I want the TCM practitioner to learn about Western medicine and be able to communicate Chinese medicine to Western medicine practitioners. And I also want Western practitioners to be able to learn about Chinese herbs. So we have a bridge, we have a common language and we can communicate with each other. Okay, otherwise, uh, we'll speak in different language and we'll go over each other's head and we won't get anywhere. Okay, so I think that's my goal in life or my goal in the career um, to help to bridge the two medicine together. You're doing a great job. And there's links to these both of these books in the questions tab underneath the questions. So if anybody would like them, I included those links there where you can purchase Dr. Chen's books. 
Uh, we want to thank Dr. Chu for this extremely informative webinar. The time that you gave us tonight is invaluable, and I know everybody here appreciated it. Um, again, we will have this recording. It'll be shared on our blog. You'll also receive an email following the webinar with a link to watch it. Um, also, the slides, I have included those into the chat, so you can download the slides. Um, the unanswered questions looks like will be best answered if you just send John an email directly. Our next webinar is gonna be on August 21st, and it's gonna be How CBD Changed My Practice Overnight, featuring Claire Onan. Um, so please join us then. I would also like to mention that Evergreen Saint Herbs are now available at Lhasa OMS, and please check your email for a great promo code discount off of them. And I thank everyone for their time tonight. Thank you, Dr. Chen, and we hope to have you with us again. Well, you're welcome. Uh, feel free, again, feel me coming your same emails. I'll be more than happy to address any of your questions. All right, well, thank you again, everybody. Have a great night. All right, bye-bye. All right, take care.